Hey you guys, um, this week we're going to be talking, we're going to be starting our ecosystem unit and the first thing we're going to talk about is abiotic and biotic factors. So we'll be looking at and answering these questions, what are the biotic and abiotic parts of an ecosystem, how do organisms and populations in the ecosystem depend on and compete for biotic and abiotic factors? So let's get started. The levels of organization in an ecosystem is organism. Now, organism is an individual form of life, such as a plant, an animal, a bacterium, a protist, or a fungus. So any of those, when we say organisms, fall into that category. Levels of organization in an ecosystem is populations. Now, when we talk about populations, it's comprised of all individuals of a given species in an area. So all elephants in that area, or all zebras in that uh, area, <coughs> or all of a certain plant in that area. That's a population of that certain species. Not all individuals are identical. Now as you can see in the pictures you have the elephants. Not all of them are identical but they are the same species. Most importantly not all members of the population are equal in their ability to survive and reproduce. So you have that survival of the fittest um, competition going on and whether or not they can reproduce and keep their species alive. All of that plays an important role in an ecosystem but even if that elephant, since we're looking at elephants, even if that animal or plant um, may be weak, it's still in that species, even though it m might have something that hinders reproduction, it is still that species. So levels of organization in the ecosystem also are a community. A uh, community are the populations of organisms of different species in a specific area at a given time. So community, kind of like urban, if you think of it, it's populations of different organisms. So we have humans, we have dogs, we have cats, we have um, different plants, different trees, all in this community. Um, so that combines everything. Um, so it's different organisms in a specific area. Just like there at this watering hole, uh, I guess, is giraffes, zebras, elephants, uh, gazelles, all of those are a community, even though they're different species. So an ecosystem is all of the living. Now when I say living, I know like in elementary school you heard living and non-living. Well, in the terms of living, it's called biotic factors. So biotic meaning kind of like biology, um, it is living. And all of the physical non-living factors is abiotic, a meaning non, and so non-biotic in an area. Um, ecosystems can only support a certain number of individuals based on the amount of food, water, living space, mates, and other resources. So an ecosystem, if it gets overpopulated, then it starts um, kind of checking and making sure something happens. Either they migrate or maybe a species dies off or um, because there's not enough food or water or living space or um, you know mates for them to reproduce at. So all of the ecosystems kind of keep in check their population count as well. So biotic factors, so biotic factors are living, are bio meaning life, living or once living um, organisms in an ecosystem. So animals, plants, um, fungi, bacteria, 
all those are living factors in an ecosystem. Now we have abiotic factors. Um, a meaning prefix of not or without. Biotic, we, you know, we said was living. So non-living elements in an ecosystem are your water, even though a lot of people say, well, water has living stuff. It, it has living stuff in them that need it to survive, but water itself, H2O, is not living. It's just comprised of different elements. Air, air has living stuff in it or that need it, but it's not living. Uh, soil, rocks, and minerals, once again, it has living stuff living in it, um, but it is not living itself. Sunlight, temperature, let me go back. All of those factors in an ecosystem is non-living. So when we say non-living, we're talking about abiotic factors. So, let me skip through those. We're not going to do these. All right, let me look at this. So what would happen if two mice produced 56 baby mice each year? Each of these mice has 56 babies each year. Calculate the total mice born in one year started by the original pair. So if you have two mice and they have 56, so there's now there's 58. And those 56 babies have 56 babies. That would be, so 56 times 56. So that would be 3,136 mice in this um, little community. Uh, we'd be run over with mice on the planet, and why doesn't this really happen? So this doesn't really happen because there's survival of the fittest. You know, if the mouse is weak, if it can compete um, with other mice, for food, then you know it survives. If it, if it can't, it dies out. Um, some mice have uh, reproduction problems that they can't reproduce, so they do not produce offspring. Um, some migrate, so they don't live in the same area, and they migrate to find food or mates. Um, so those migrate off. So there's different factors that play into the role of of um, animals or plants or living things becoming overpopulized in an area. So a carrying capacity is the largest number of individuals of the same species that an area can support. So say an ecosystem has a carrying capacity of 100 deer. So if it becomes um, over 100, then the environmental factors keep it in check. And if the population exceeds the carrying capacity, some individuals will die because of lack of food or move to another location. Or um, we, if you look at the um, chart here, you have the minimum animal population and max um, population and then you have winter, spring, summer, and autumn down at the bottom. Um, all of these show you kind of like in the winter animal population is um, kind of at a minimum. Then you hit spring and summer and that's when most of your babies are born. Um, and then it starts to taper off in the autumn because it's becoming colder, they're hibernating or they're getting ready for winter or migrating. Um, so that kind of tapers off. Also, when we have this tapering off, I know in November we have hunting, hunting seasons and other months we have hunting seasons. So that also helps control population as well. That's, a, that's why you're allowed to kill so many deer or so many uh, turkeys or squirrels or whatever you hunt for. Um, but all of these things that uh, does not allow our, the population to get overpopulated is called um, limiting factors. 
the limiting factors, if you think of it, limits the overflow of this certain species in that ecosystem. So limiting factors in abiotic or biotic factor that limits the number of individuals that it can live in an ecosystem. So it can be living factors, it can be non-living factors. Um, this keeps the population from growing too large. Um, how do biotic factors limit other organisms in its environment? So how do living um, things or living factors limit the carrying capacity and its competition for food? Uh, when resources are scarce, fewer organisms can survive, so the strongest survive. Um, when resources are plentiful, greater numbers of organisms can survive. So if there's not that many and there's a lot more resources, you don't have to compete or, you know, fight for your food. They all just survive. Also, predator and prey relationships. So we have predatory and prey relationships. The uh, greater the number of prey, the greater the number of predators. Um, fewer the number of prey, the fewer the number of predators. The reason is, if you have a large amount of prey, then you will have a large amount of things that hunt that prey. Um, if you're going to have fewer number of prey, then you're going to have fewer number of predators because eventually those predators will move and migrate to other places. Uh, parasitism, when an organism lives off a host, organisms sometimes killing the host, um, worms in an animal's digestive tract can kill them. Uh, mistletoe, if I know everybody loves mistletoe at Christmas, but it is actually a parasite in a tree and it takes from the tree. Uh, pine bark beetles invade and kill pine trees. So all of these parasites, um, like ticks that we know of, can carry diseases. Um, mosquitoes can carry diseases and it can kill off different things that they come in contact with. That's also a limiting factor. Um, diseases, like we talked about the tick, when outbreaks kill off most or all populations. Um, the flu back in 1918, uh, millions of human deaths. Uh, once again, we're seeing this with the pandemic with COVID. It's a disease outbreak. Um, Lyme disease is carried by ticks. Some people survive, some people don't. It just depends. Um, human activities also destroy all, destroy animal habitats, and um, like development, building um, houses or commercial buildings in a heavily forced um, place can also uh, move animals or kill off animals um, that live there. Uh, damming rivers, so if you dam up a river to um, keep the water from flowing that way, like the Hoover Dam, sometimes they use that for um, hydroelectric system. So it dams up the water, but they use the electric for, or use the water to help generate electricity. Um, but damming rivers can kill um, the species that live in the water, or they can. Uh, um, eventually they'll migrate other places. Clear cutting force, like I've said. Um, abiotic factors that limit organisms in an ecosystem are the sun. So we talked about availability increases photosynthesis. So the um, stronger the direct sunlight we have, the more photosynthesis is going to happen in our plants. So plants can be for sunlight by growing taller than those around them. Temperature, warm, lush areas support greater numbers of population with less competition occurring. So your warmer places have a lot of populations that live there because um, it's warmer, it's easier to survive than your colder temperatures. So cold, harsh areas support limited numbers of populations with greater competition occurring. So not very many live there, um, so they have to compete for their food more than other places. Soil is another factor, so nutrient-rich soils produce more carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus and support larger populations. 
so the less competition for a plant to survive. Nutrients that are poor soils support smaller populations, so they have to compete to, be su to survive. Water, so availability, movement, temperature, saltiness, chemical compro uh, components like the quality of water, all affect the competition and ability to survive in populations. Um, so the better the water, the more um, ability for populations to survive, so the greater the competition. And then vice versa if the water is damaged or not as pure. So how do abiotic, uh, abiotic factors limit organisms in an ecosystem? Um, changing conditions, so droughts, floods, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes bring about changes that reduce populations. So you know, things that we go through in our world also um, reduce populations that are not living. What factor was removed from this ecosystem? So, all biotic and abiotic factors are interrelated. In nature, you will find that if one factor is changed or removed, it impacts the ability of other resources within the system. So which one was removed from this ecosystem? Water. Um, so that's why there's a drought, there's fewer animals um, that survive. How did it affect the population? Like I said, either they die off or they migrate and find water other places. We will actually look at ecosystems more in depth. Um, we'll talk about limiting factors and populations. We will look at maybe playing a game or kind of figuring out a safe way to play the game. Um, oh dear, I don't know if you played it last year or you've heard of it before, um, but we will look at that and that will actually give you a visual and I think there might be a simulation that we can show you of how populations are affected by limiting factors. Um, if you have any questions during the week over your work, please let me or Mr. Smith know, and we will help you in any way possible. Thank you.